my name is Meredith White and I teach Spanish one and two just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. On my screen, you can see what I do for the first day of Spanish one. And I'm going to go through each activity. So it's basically my lesson plan. I try um, really hard to prioritize getting in the target language and staying in the target language from the beginning uh, because it sets the precedent that we're going to be in the target language. We're not going to learn about Spanish. We're going to learn in Spanish. And it simultaneously teaches or gives students a little insight about myself. I'm really personal. I don't do, or not personal, sorry, that's another word, private. Um, and I keep, so I keep my personal information to myself and pretty private, but I share a lot about who I am. I don't share a lot about my life or hardly anything really once in a while, uh, like a dog picture and that's it. So, um, I also want to kind of break the ice with my students because, you know, hi, we're all sitting together in this room now and I'm speaking in a foreign language, but I hate icebreakers. Like my personality would probably, uh, allow someone to assume I love icebreakers. I hate icebreakers because I think conversation is the icebreaker. I think the language is the icebreaker. It suddenly thrusts students to all be in the same kind of vulnerable position. And um, I think we can find joy in that vulnerability and teachable moments that teach both about us, but also kind of about our class. So I don't go over like the syllabus or the grading procedures, all of that's online. And all of that's in our learning management system. It shows how the grades are weighted, I've already got the whole unit's grades plugged in, so that serves as a calendar. So the names of the assignments are already there um, and the information's already transparent. So I just dive right in. This is the warm-up slide they see after they get seated. And the way they get seated is I have um, a seating chart. I have the numbers of their roster, um, like what number they are on the roster, like posted on the board and they find that number of the chair. So it's really simple. I do not have desks. So the number of the chair corresponds with their roster number. So number four goes to chair four, number five goes to chair five. And that allows me to not make a seating chart, but still have a seating chart. So if student number six between Monday and Tuesday gets a schedule change and tomorrow student five becomes four and six becomes five and they all shift one, it's okay. I still just have to screenshot the list and put it on the slide, find that chair. So things are allowed to shift. It's not like a permanent number, but for some it may be, especially if they're at the end of the roster and therefore don't get changed by shifts in a previous number. So this is the warm-up slide they see. They use my warm-up paper and they pick four of the five options, excuse me, four of the six options to do. And they write the question or write the statement or whatever it was on the paper and then respond accordingly. So these are very cognate heavy, obviously. PRHS is my school and um, I gave a hint here. So there's a lot of scaffolding and a lot of cognates, obviously like official animal, etc. I didn't want to use like mascota, even though I've run into native speaker friends who use mascota, not just for pet, but also for actual mascot. But I figured let's not do that. And then you've got a little scaffolding in the corner here that gives them some, you know, helpful information that might be obvious to some, but others might be hesitant. So basically if I expand this, it will show you my lesson plan essentially if I can get it to do it, there we go. So they're gonna get in their seats, we're gonna practice our call and response, which is classe classe, and they say CC, and I do it about two or three times, never more than three, more than three and there's some kind of issue. But the way that the students are set up, they know that by the third time, they needed to have like, okay, finish the sentence with a friend, and we're here, and I need all eyes on me. Um, they're gonna write their names on their class folders that I provide, and then we're gonna jump right into this um, slide with the teal at the top. Um, as I'm taking attendance, as they're doing, as they're picking four options, I'm taking attendance. So I'm walking around and looking at which numbers of chairs aren't filled and then confirming with each student like that that's their name and they're on the right, they're on the right chair and if they go by anything different. Um, we go right into then the input. So it's got a lot of scaffolding as you can see and we're going to start talking about tattoos, which I know is like bizarre to people. Um, who are like, wait, it's Spanish one, it's day one. Like they don't know the word for that. No, but it's a cognate. Um, and so you've got tatuaje, artista, and I've got all these cognates. Um, and basically I just jump right in. I know that I'm gonna use a Nicky Jam music video. And so I happen to have a picture of Nicky Jam. The artist that you can see with the Ganga Tattoo Instagram page is Odell Beckham Jr., the professional athletes. Um, per, like tech, not personal tattoo artist, but like that's the only person um, he goes to and he's in Spain. So it's a target culture, um, perfect opportunity because a lot of my kids will know Odell Beckham Jr. 
Um, I can remind them where Spain is. And also like tattoos are just interesting. Um, many of my students have tattoos, even if they're just small. And um, I am a very tattooed person. So I'm going to slide this over. It allows my students to um, get to know a little something about me that's going to be very obvious because I have very, very visible tattoos. Um, and then depending on what I wear, so if I wear a shirt that, you know, maybe like comes over here a little bit, then all of a sudden they're exposed to, um, to more of that. So I am a very, I'm a very tattooed person and they start to see that. And then they start to see too, that I am comfortable with talking about that. So, um, cause they mean a lot to me, obviously you wouldn't hopefully get something permanent on your body, uh, if it wasn't meaningful in some way. And so I go right into it and then I can use really fun words that I know I already have written on my board that I can be pointing to like, um, tango, me gusta, soy, and all of those. So I've got these scaffolding, these images and the scaffolding projected. And then I've also got, um, things written on the board that are just really simple. Basically the super seven is, has, goes, etc. And so I can say things like, um, in the future and el futuro, um, you know, and go from there. Same thing with the in mi opinion, you know, I can state my opinion and then I can ask in tu opinion as, as bueno, as malo, as positivo, negativo. And I can go from there. So I'll be giving lots of input on, um, Odell Beckham Jr. Nikki Jam that they're famous. Um, that they're, um, that this artist is very artistic, obviously. And he's also very famous and he costs a lot of money. He costs a thousand dollars an hour, which, oh my goodness, that's a lot of money. And so it's a lot of input. So it's keeping students engaged. Now at the same time, let me move this slide up here so you can see that better. What students are doing, because that's the key. What are students doing? Listening is okay. But what are they listening for? Or what are they listening toward? What's the next thing? My students will have this um, interpretive listening rubric that we adjusted. It's Anne Marie Chase's, oh, which is amazing, at senorachase.com. And um, we just adjusted it in, in my department and then put some of the percentages and, and so on. So as students are listening, they're seeing how many like words, ideas, full sentences they can understand. So they're just interpretively um, kind of doing a little self-assessment day one, which is pretty cool. So that was out of order. Um, and so they've got this. I'm talking. Um, I keep talking. El tatuador de famosos. And I keep going. Again, I've got this scaffolding here on both sides. And um, this is a an exhibit that happened like a year or two ago. And I think the artist still does once in a while, but I, I have the video linked right here that I can click on. But it's an artist who, an artist to the stars. He does like a lot of celebrity tattoos and the he will open up and do free ones at this gallery. But all, but the jig, it, like the trick is that you have to put your arm in the hole and like you don't get to see what it is. So you don't see him, he doesn't see you. Um, and he just kind of tattoos whatever he wants. Um, within reason, obviously they're not profane or anything, but so you take a risk and it's got to be on the arm. It can't be anywhere else. So I ask them about that. And then at the bottom, so you've got like, would you dare, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So as I'm pointing to that, they can see what it means. And so they're starting to internalize it. And I'm able to stay in the language, which is really cool. We make the same comparisons. Is this art, you know, is this positive or negative, ugly or pretty with um, like street art, graffiti, all those kind of things. Is it art or is it a problem? Tattoos, art or problem? Um, you know, in your mom's opinion, what what is your mom's opinion on tattoos? And it's so funny to watch students go, oh, no, uh, mm, you know, and they might not be able to remember that word. And I'm like, oh, terrible. And they're like, oh, terrible. Like, so funny. And then other people's like, no, mama, mama, mucho, mucho, you know, grande or whatever, something that they've heard you say along the line. And so they're trying to express like, oh, their mom has a lot. So it's funny to see different, ex different experiences and different opinions within the same class. So it's input, input, input. We're going to turn to um, a little bit more input, but again, they're listening. So they pause on the rubric. Now I'm like, okay, so take a guess. I had said like, this artist's name is blah, blah, blah. This art, this musical artist's name is Nikki Jam. This football artist, so I've said Sayama a few times. I'm going to come right into um, Nikki Jam's song, Hasta el um, Amanecer. So I've got literally, we're just matching out loud. Como tu te llamas? Yo no sé, me llamo. And then we watch the video. I do a movie talk. I pause it. I say, is the girl interested? Is she ignoring him? Is the boy interested? Is the girl interested? And I've got girl and boy written on the board. And I know it's going to segue into our story that starts Tuesday. Then the students turn, they do some interpersonal. All they're asking is, como te llamas? 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 And so they're going to add this question here. Like they're going to put the student's name here 
and then just repeat it here, but that's okay. I want to, te amas, me amo, como te amas, me amo, como te amas, me amo. As many people as they can, five to 10 probably, and this can be adjusted. Um, it says 10 minutes, but I can make it five. And then we will do our exit card, which is um, four questions. We do four every day. And so we do 20 by the end of the week, and you can see a screenshot of the paper they use by the end. So um, I will check those at the end of the week, and they will get a grade for that. So it's taking things that they heard, still putting them in an accessible way um, and very accessible and approachable, even for a student who was like, oh my God, the whole time because it was all in Spanish. Um, but again, if it's a topic that's personal to me because I have a lot of tattoos and I'm very open about that and they're visible. Um, and so it takes a little bit of my personality, infuses that, or a lot, I guess, infuses that and allows me to be teaching joyfully while also being very intentional and getting some of those management pieces set up uh, and so on and so forth. If you want to see a picture of how my classroom sets up, this is the first thing, again, day one, this is the first thing they see when they come in. So my chairs are numbered on the back and on the front. So one to, I mean, do I have 33, 36, 33? Um, I got to take out three, so it's only 33 now, not 36. And um, and then their backpacks are going to go over here in this white space. So that's that's my day one starter. Their warm up sheet looks like this. It's got a whole. It's got all of unit one stapled in there. So all of the regular routine papers that they'll need, like that interpersonal roster, and um, as well as my little bitmoji sticker. And I provide the folder. So as they come in, I will hand that to them. And they will put all their stuff off to the side, backpack, phone, whatever, whatever. And we're going to rock and roll and just get right into Spanish. Um, there are moments built in this week, especially like on the warm up sheet and on um, a couple of the warm up questions, again, cognate heavy, that, that sort of also embed classroom routines, locations, et cetera. And so, again, it doesn't. It doesn't require an icebreaker or it doesn't require a like, and here are the pencils and here are the pens. Those things are visible, but again, conversation and the questioning piece is the icebreaker itself. So I always love the first week and it sets a really nice um, precedent for like coming in and getting right to it. I find that it's really hard to convince students that you aren't who they initially thought you to be. And that is for better or for worse. If the first week and all of those first impressions were just a disaster, it's really hard to convince students that you have your life together and that I swear I'm organized um, and I know what we're doing and I've incorporated backward design. It's really hard to convince them of that the same way that it's hard to convince them if that first week or that first couple weeks or that first month, um, you are like on point, planned out minute to minute, yet still flexible. You are smiling, making eye contact, being firm, but yet warm. Those aren't mutually exclusive, you know, all those kind of things. And then you have a crappy day. It's really hard to convince students that like, that you aren't that great person that they originally, that really effective teacher that they originally thought you to be. It's like, oh yeah, I think she had a bad day. She must be, oh, that must be going on because that's who they see you to be as someone who's organized and planned and open to asking them things and wants to know about them and care. So um, I like to change up uh, my routine, especially at the first, at the beginning of the year from kind of what I think their expectations are going to be, which is probably go over the syllabus and talk about grades and tell where stuff's located all in English. I like to just jump right in and all of that stuff and like class jobs, those all fill in later as their personalities evolve, as you see who might work to do what, etc. And so I really like it. So I hope this helps. Um, and I will attach any files or anything applicable in the comments.